Welcome back to FN 10th. My name is Paril Jain and I am a graduate student at University of Pennsylvania. This lecture will be focused on the concepts of simultaneous localization and mapping centered around the FN 10th autonomous car platform. Last week we talked about the sensors being used for the car, localization and PID control. As you proceed further using the approach discussed in previous lectures, I am sure you will notice certain limitations on how smart your algorithm can work. The information pursued by the car at this stage are limited to current LiDAR scans and decisions made were suboptimal. For example, in this image, your car is present in a college corridor. The green line is the desired path you have to follow. Your path assignments would just involve the information of which turn the car should take rather than a proper trajectory. Another important task we want to accomplish with this platform is follow race lines and take precise turns at maximum possible velocity. As you can see in the image, the car should be aware of the paths before and after the turn to choose the optimal path and manipulate the speed accordingly. In several cases, it's not just about optimizing the turn the car can view at present. The decision making should, should be smart enough to choose the race lines depending upon the next turn as well. As shown in the image here, you have two possible paths. Both follow the optimal path at the first turn, but the green line is the most efficient one in order to optimize the second turn as well. The path selection is heavily influenced by the remaining track under such scenarios. All of this can be easily achieved if the cars have future track information while making path decisions. Well, even the Formula 1 drivers are aware of the track before they start the race. Over the next few lectures, we will talk about how do we go about mapping the racetrack, make the car smart enough to perceive the surroundings and localize within this track. We will then talk about how you combine both this information to generate trajectories and follow them to complete the race. To begin with, let's go through the concept of simultaneous localization and mapping, also known as SLAM. SLAM is often considered as a chicken egg problem. You need a map of the environment to determine robot location, but you need the robot's location first to build the map itself. The way SLAM works is, you register your initial map from the first scan and initial pose estimate. The car then moves by a minor amount in a small time interval. We now have a new laser scan measurement and an estimate of the car motion. The current laser scans are then correlated with the map observed till this stage to estimate the change in position. This way, at each stage you get a new pose estimate with which we update the map. This process continues over several time samples, updating the map at each step. Let's see the map being generated by the car. Looks pretty simple, right? Let's delve, delve into it further and analyze it at implementation level. There are a number of ways in which you could have approached this problem and there are loads of research articles comparing them. We will talk about an approach centered around the ROS package called Hector Slam you will be using for this platform. The map we built here is an occupancy grid. As you can see in the image, the occupancy grid is nothing but a standard grid where value of each cell indicates if it is an occupied cell, free cell or unexplored cell. The cells where we get confirmed LiDAR hits over several iterations are considered occupied cells and they build the walls or occlusions for the map. The cells considered as free cells are the ones where the LiDAR scans had the chance to pass through but did not get blocked away by any obstacle. And the third type obviously corresponds to the cells where the LiDAR scans have never been able to explore anything. Now when we place the car in this occupancy grid, the LiDAR heads need to be ported to the cell values. We maintain a separate database of the laser measurements corresponding to each cell values. We consider these measurements as 1 for a coordinate where we have a LiDAR ray endpoint, 0 for the coordinates between the endpoints and the car. 
the cells or say pixels in this occupancy grid correspond to 1, minus 1 or 0 depending upon the cell state whether it's occupied, free or unexplored. We define a measurement model as the probability of cell being occupied or free given the LiDAR measurement being 1 or 0 which indicates the estimated uncertainty in the LiDAR data. LiDAR measurements are pretty accurate. However, you might not want to trust them completely as you may have people moving around while mapping the environment. Now for each given laser scan, the probability values of each cell the LiDAR scan passes through will be less than 1 and hence the accumulated probability will jump to almost 0 values and make no sense. To avoid this underflow, we deal with log probabilities. You can see two equations here. One corresponds to the log probability for occupied cells and the other one for free cells. During each timestamp, we update the robot pose and map this constants to particular map cells. This tells us the odds of a particular cell being occupied or free. We keep adding this constants for each cell over iterations to determine the confidence level. In robotics, it's a general rule. You deal with unexpected noise sources and hence you should never be completely certain of your observation. As we mentioned, we keep adding this constants to the cells to accumulate the confidence level if the cells are free or occupied. To avoid being completely certain, we saturate the cell values with an upper or lower limit so that if updated due to a noise or unexpected moving surrounding features, the future measurements can bring it back to the correct state. Now when you start building the map, you take in the initial pose of the robot as 0, 0 and update the map cells taking in the first laser scan. For example, if this image is the laser scan at initial stage, this is how the first map registration would look like. The initial map is directly updated by using the log probabilities for occupied and free cells. When the car proceeds a bit further, our goal is to find the post change with respect to the previous measurement. We do this by finding the transformation between the new laser scan and the previously registered map. As you can see here, we have a scan at time instant T1. The robot moves by a small amount and takes a left turn. The laser scans as viewed from the robot frame at time T2 might look like this second image. Scan matching will allow us to find the post change between these two timestamps and align the scan at second time instant with the first scan. The change in pose measured with this approach is used to maintain the robot pose while updating the map simultaneously. The laser scans we get are point clouds which give us information about the 2D map of the current environment around the robot within its distance range. The most common approach to find the transformation between the point clouds is iterative to closest point also known as ICP. For example, let's say we have two point clouds the red one and the blue one. We need to find the transformation which aligns these two. Thus, the goal is to find the R and T matrices that would align the red point cloud to the blue one. The ICP algorithm tries to minimize the root mean squared distance between both these point clouds over rotation and translation matrices. The process is run over several iterations. At each iteration, we find the R and T matrix, transform the red point cloud using those matrix and run the ICP again. As you can see here, the process quickly moves towards convergence. Let's see the approach taken by Hector Slam to find the transform between two consecutive scans. Here, the symbol Xi represents the pose of the robot. The function SI represents the end coordinates of the ith scan when the pose is Xi. The function M gives the value of the map cell at each particular scan coordinate. As we talked earlier, the map cell values correspond to 1, minus 1 and 0. Because this correlation is done over occupied cells, you can mask the negative values to 0. 
the equation here suggests that the term within the brackets is 0 for a point where map cell value or say function m is 1. Thus, when each scan point corresponds to a map cell having value 1, the summation will result in a 0. For a normal case where we do have certain uncertainties and minor errors, our goal is to minimize this summation. The pose function xi can also be written as summation of previous pose and the change in pose in the small time interval. This now changes the minimization function to the function over change in pose. We expand the equation using the Taylor expansion for function m. Solving it for delta xi gives us the Gauss-Newton equation, evaluation of which gives a step change in pose with respect to the previous timestamp. Now this operation will give you the change in pose at each timestamp. We update the pose with the calculated pose change, transform the current LiDAR scans to the new pose. The map is then updated using this transformed laser scans. This video depicts the way, way you get the LiDAR data in the car's view of the world. The Hector scan matcher will take in this data match the scans between two timestamps while registering the map and update the car pose at each stage. This video shows the LiDAR scan data when viewed from the map frame. The change in pose estimate is evaluated at each stage to calculate the new pose and the scans are being aligned to the new pose. The map registered in the video we just saw would look like this. We observed that once we have the change in pose estimate, we transform the scan to global frame and update the global map with these scans. However, the occupancy grid doesn't assign a wall or a free space by directly observing a single scan as it might introduce a lot of noise. Observe the video carefully. Apart from the binary occupancy grid visible to us, the algorithm also maintains a value for each cell. The value is a function of number of times the cell is encounter encountered by the scan as free or occupied and the probability of scan measurement being correct. Thus, after every few laser scans, when the map is confident of a particular chunk of cells being free or occupied, it gets published as an occupancy map which you see here. Now in this kind of optimization functions, there is a high possibility of getting stuck in local minima. In order to avoid this, rather than using a single occupancy grid, the equation is optimized first over coarser maps to find a pose estimate. The estimate is then used as an input to the optimization function over higher resolution map. If we provide the resolution of 5 cm as an input to Hector SLAM and have decided on using three multi-resolution grids, the algorithm will iterate over the grids of resolution 20 cm, 10 cm and 5 cm. The pose update from 20 cm grid will be an input to the process over 10 cm grid and so on. The map generated here is now a base for further algorithms of localization and planning. It is essential to save this map and be capable of loading it later on. ROS package called map server provides this functionality. Coming back to pose updates during Hector Slam we get a change in pose during analysis of laser scan at each timestamp and thus a source of odometry. Ignoring the map being generated, we can also use Hector SLAM package to get a source of odometry information obtained via scan matching. You can also think of using the canonical scan matcher package for the same task. Both these approaches will give odometry information. The main difference, Hector SLAM calculates the change in pose by matching the current LiDAR scan with the map generated during previous timestamp. Whereas, the CSM package does this by correlating the current scan with the previous laser scan. You have seen the tree diagram in the previous lecture, haven't you? This is the transform tree for our system once the localization algorithm implemented. The Hector odometry provides the transform between the odometry frame and the base frame. 
when you will use this package in ROS, you will com come across a wide set of parameters. You can go through the website of Hector Mapping Package to read about them in further detail. The map resolution parameter allows you to specify how fine you want your map to be. The next two allow you to specify the distance or angle threshold by which the robot should move between consecutive map updates. The default max laser distance is set to 30 meters by this package. But the LiDAR you will be using has a range of 10 meters. The last two parameters are the log odds constants for occupied and free cells we talked about during the map update stage. In the tutorial, we will talk about how to go about installing the package and using the basic launch file for your application. The next lecture will go over the concepts and implementation details of Adaptive Monte Carlo localization and also show you how to integrate the map and odometry we generated today for the localization package.